Well, if somebody's going to believe God, I want it to be me. So tell your neighbor, if somebody's going to believe God, I want it to be me. Amen. If there's going to be a miracle in town, if there's going to be an answered prayer in town, if God's going to listen to anybody, if God's going to answer a prayer, then it ought to be right here. Amen. You ready for the word? This is my Bible. It is the word of God and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the word says I am, seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today, my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I'm taught the word of God, my life has changed for the better, and I'll never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 2, and the message this morning is water into wine. We've been in this series on increase. And what we've basically been doing is we have been marching through the Word of God and we have been looking at miracles that have to do with increase. And I believe that God has set you up for increase in 2013. Why would He lead me to teach on this if this is not what He had in mind for you in 2013? And we have been receiving incredible testimonies of people getting increases, people seeing debt forgiven, people paying cars off, credit cards, and houses. I mean, just last week we got a praise report of some folks that paid their house off, and, and these are people that are working people. I mean, these are, these are people that, are, they're laborers. In other words, they're not like a dentist or a veterinarian or something like that. They don't even, uh, I mean... They're just people. And here a while back, another couple paid their house off, same thing. And uh, <clears throat> we had a report of a lady, uh, got a 30% pay raise, and then last week somebody else got a 29% pay raise. So it's really a cop-out to say, well, Congress this, and Washington that, and the economy that, and the stock market, and the Fed, and this, and that, and the other. No. If we look to those entities as our source, they may not fail us today, but they're going to fail us. They're going to fail us big time. We have to keep our focus on the Word of God. The great apostle of faith of the 19th century, Smith Wigglesworth, used to say that Mark 4.28 was his favorite verse in the Bible. And I love this as a launching place this morning because it gives a, re a realistic perspective of faith. Mark 4.28 says, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, <clears throat> first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. And I love that for two reasons. Number one, it paints a picture of faith as being a matter of sowing and reaping. And I love that. Because we live in this society. You know, the other night, uh, Sue made popcorn for me the old-fashioned way, and I'm like, you know, come on, come on, come on. I mean, you know, my God, how long is this going to take? Because we're used to just throwing the, the bag full of preservatives and God knows what into the microwave. In two minutes, we have popcorn, right? But then the next day, you feel like, oh, my God, what did I eat? Well, it's because it's got all that nasty stuff in it. So she made it the old-fashioned way. It takes time. And so... Faith is not magic. It's not like something we can do in a microwave two minutes. There's a process to faith. And that's why we talk in terms of building a life of faith. So when we come to the offering time and we give in the offering, we're not giving for Monday, per se, or Tuesday. The money we give today is going to be bringing dividends back to us maybe in a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, when we give it a challenge offering, it could be a while before we see the final payoff on that giving. Why? Because faith is a matter of sowing and reaping. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. And the second thing I love about that is it, it speaks to me of faith being a process. And so... If, if you came forward for healing this morning 
and you feel like you're 10% better, 15% better, 20% better, you don't settle for that. And you don't go home and say, well, I guess it didn't work. Here's what you do. You go home and say, well, thank God I'm better. And tomorrow I'll be even better. And Tuesday I'll be, I'll, I'll be better every day. And by Sunday, whatever I'm facing will be gone. In other words, it's a process. There's a process. A lot of times people have walked off of the, the miracle and the blessing that was potentially theirs because they got disappointed. They got disappointed that they didn't get everything in a microwave two minutes. So in this series on increase, we're saying that God has a plan to increase you in 2013. But in order for you to receive that, in order for me to receive that, we have to believe it, we have to expect it, we have to confess it, and then we have to take action toward it. And that last part is the discipline. We have to take action toward it. And as we begin this message, because we're, we have crossed over in the, into the New Testament today, I want to give you three principles of seed faith giving, and we've not given you these in a long time. Number one, God is the source of your supply. So whatever you're looking to God for, whether it's a, a job, a better job, a promotion, an increase, a healing, God is the source of your success. Now, that doesn't mean we're impolite on the job. When we get a promotion, when we get an increase, we don't tell the boss, you're not my source, God did this. We're not stupid. So we're very polite, we're very grateful, we shake their hand, we thank them profusely, and then when we get to our prayer closet, we give God the credit, we give God the thanksgiving, we give God the glory. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. Just this week, I forgot what it was, it'll come to me in a minute, but, but I just had to stop, and I just had to lift my hands, oh I know what it was, it was something that happened financially in my daughter's life and my son-in-law's life, I just had to stop, and I had to lift my hands and give God the credit, the glory, and the honor, because what happened was a manifestation of our steadfastness and confession, so God's the source. Number two, God wants to be first in your life and in your giving, so whatever you give, you give it as a seed faith, but whatever you do, whatever you give, you put God first. How many of you want God to be, how many of you want to be first in God's eyes. I mean, do you want to be put on call waiting when you pray? No, we, we, when we pray, when we go to God, we don't want to hear who dat. So if we want to be first with God, we have to put God first. And then number three, when you give, expect a miracle. When you give in the offering here in a little bit, have your expector turned on. Expect God to use it to further his gospel, but also expect God to multiply it back into your life in the form of meeting your needs and empowering you to reach your faith goals, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We have been authorized to believe God for 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And if he didn't want us to know it, he should never have told us about it. But since he told us about it, it's too late. We know about it, so we have been authorized to believe him. Now, all things being equal, if you're a moral person and if you're a tithing Christian, if you're industrious and not a slacker, what is the difference between Christians who dramatically pull ahead and others who are just kind of blessed? And the answer is in John chapter 2. We can make three mistakes in our giving, and hopefully as you hear the message today, you'll see these mistakes for what they are and counteract the temptation to give into these three common mistakes Christians make. They make the mistake of not giving what the Holy Spirit tells them to give. I have disciplined myself to give what God tells me to give. If I know it's God, you know, if I've got a question mark in my mind, I might set it aside and then wait for the Lord to speak to me again, or I have an advantage being married. I can take it to Pastor Sue. You pray about it. We compare notes after prayer. But once I know it's God, I have disciplined myself to give what God says because I trust him that he is looking out for my best interest. Number two, when we give, we don't attach our anticipation or our expectation or our faith to the gift. I don't think it would hurt at all. On your offering envelope, I don't think it would hurt at all to write on there somewhere on the front or on the back. Two or three faith goals. I mean, what's wrong with that? Why, why not attach 
specifically our faith to what we're believing God for. Everybody here this morning has got stuff you want to buy. Everybody here this morning has got stuff you want to sell. Everybody here this morning has got things you have in mind as financial goals. I mean, why would it hurt to jot two or three of those on the envelope and attach, as it were, our faith to the giving? And then a third mistake people make is we secularize. What do I mean by that? Well, we come to church and we worship God on Sunday, and then when we go to work on Monday, we leave God at church. We don't take God with us. Now, I don't have time to go there this morning, but if you go to Deuteronomy 28, you go to Psalm 1, you go to Psalm 23, you go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, we find out that God blesses the work of our hands. So I do my giving on Sunday, but then when I go to work on Monday, I'm taking God with me. I learned this, I learned this in Bible school after my dad cut me off financially and I was on my own at the age of 18. I learned this selling cookware. I would sit in uh, church on Sunday. I would decide in my little brain how much money I wanted to make in the next seven days. I would take that, mu- that amount and I would multiply that times 0.2 and I'd give it in the offering. In other words, I gave a tithe in advance and then an offering of 10% in advance. Now, somebody might say, that's nuts. Well, I was rated 19th worldwide working part-time. So it, it was nuts like crazy as a fox. I mean, it worked. And there were weeks that I didn't match that. There were weeks I pulled ahead. But I mean, it worked. And I learned the power of taking God to work with me. I'm telling you, say it out loud, there is great power in taking God to work with you. Hold your hands up, say it out loud. I believe that what the Word says about my life is true. I believe these hands are blessed at everything I put them to. It just changes your whole attitude. When you go to work, it just changes your whole attitude. John chapter 2, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everything, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Now, if you're new to church, if you're new to the faith message, if you're new to this perspective of the word of God, If there's only one thing you remember this morning, I want you to remember this one thing. I am 57 years old. I got saved when I was five. I started tithing when I was five. I have walked in covenant with God 52 years, and I am still amazed on a weekly basis, weekly, how... He cares about the small details of my life. Just this week, just this week, I had a situation where I thought I I had spent some money needlessly, and I was kind of lamenting that, and then I just, you know, okay, and I mentally went on down the road, and the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, why don't you see if you can get that back? Thought never occurred to me. So I sent an email. I haven't used this 
Can I get a refund on this? Email comes back, yeah. I, I, I can't even express what's in my heart. Listen, we leave all kinds of blessings on the table because we're not listening. You know, Jesus said that the hairs on our head were numbered, and we kind of read that and blow past that like that is a metaphor. Well, what if it's not? What if he meant what he said and said what he meant? You know, we live in an, in an age of mendacity in a country filled with liars. What if Jesus meant what he said and said what he meant? And you know, if you look at your hairbrush, the number of hairs on your head changes daily. Well, what, what I'm saying is that is the, we have not even comprehended the degree to which he loves us. So here's this young couple, young Jewish couple, and they're getting married. Isn't that a nice thing? And they have a party afterwards. Isn't that a nice thing? But obviously they had a budget. And they ran out. And our Lord and Savior was such a great guy and so in tune with the needs of people that he cared. Now, he didn't really want to get into this because he was just beginning his ministry and the religious folks and the politicians were going to put him to death. So he really wanted to operate at least a while under the radar. But his mother comes to him and says, they've run out of wine. He says, well, what does that have to do with me? In other words, I'd rather not get involved in public miracles this quick. In other words, I want to do some teaching before they kill me. She turns to the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, do. And tell your neighbor, that's the power to all of it. That's the power to all of it. And you know, it's just so funny to me, it's just so funny to me that people have a problem with this. I mean, they have a problem with this. They have a problem with this. But you know, some numbskull politician says, buy a green car, you go buy a green car. Some numbskull politician says, you know, use light bulbs that you can't even read with, but they cause cancer. And you go buy light bulbs that you can't read with and they cause cancer. In other words, we just believe all kinds of stuff. They say gays are born that way and you just believe it. I mean, but studies, there have been studies of identical twins that disprove the theory that they're born that way. Because if they were born that way, both identical twins would be homosexual. But they've done these studies, I mean, tens of thousands of identical twins, and that is not the case. But they tell us stuff, and we repeat it. Not only are we dumb enough to believe it, we repeat it. Well, I'm a simple guy, and I say to myself, if I'm going to believe anybody, if I'm going to believe anybody, I'm going to believe God. Amen. And I might miss it, me, a human being, listening to his spirit, I could miss it there, but I can't miss anything reading that book. Amen. So that's where you start. You know, where, where Mary said, whatever he tells you to do, do. You don't start with the Holy Spirit, actually. You start with the written Word of God because we are human beings. We can miss God. We could eat too much pizza and think we heard something or we had a dream. We can miss it. But you can't miss it reading the Word of God. And so when she says, whatever he tells you to do, do, I take that first off and I apply it to the Word of God. Then, secondly, I apply that to the Holy Spirit. Number one, Jesus is concerned about your every need. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. You have all kinds of needs in your life. You have needs for food and clothing and shelter and transportation. And all of this takes money, and God knows that. He wants to be the Lord of your entire life, not just the Lord of your soul. And listen, if you're here this morning and you're under the gun financially, if you're here this morning and you're in the corner financially, 
my challenge to you is to let Jesus become the Lord of your entire life. When I use the word secularize, in other words, we, we worship God on Sunday, then we go to work on Monday, and we don't take God with us to work, another term we could use there, a synonym we could use there would be to compartmentalize. And I've met, I don't know how many people, and they compartmentalize their lives. So they go to church and they worship God on Sunday, then they lie through their teeth making a living on Monday. I can't do that. I cannot compartmentalize. If, if I'm a Christian on Sunday, I've got to be a Christian on Monday. But wait a minute. On the other side of the coin, not just on ethics and moral conduct, and standards of behavior, but wait a minute, how about believing I receive? I, I don't just believe I receive on Sunday, I can go to work on Monday and believe I receive. Yeah. I'm taking God with me. So I don't compartmentalize my life. Number two, the key to receiving a miracle is obedience. I, I dare you, I dare you to read the Bible. You know, you could do it in a year, just follow the Bible reading program online. Read the Bible. And every time there's a miracle, write down whether or not a human being took action preceding the miracle. And you will discover that in the majority of miracles in the Bible, human action precedes the miracle. Here it did. There wouldn't have been a miracle if they had not done what Jesus said do. Number two, the key to receiving a miracle is obedience. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. See, everybody wants a miracle, but not everyone wants to obey the written word of God. Everyone wants a miracle, but not everyone wants to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Everyone wants what you've got, but not everyone wants to do what you did to get what you got. You know, I could stand here and tell you stories, I mean, real life situations where we, we came to a dead end, there was nowhere to go, and it, the Holy Spirit said, well, how about this, how about that, check this, check that, and, and then I would take what I heard from the, the Lord in prayer, and it opened up a whole new path to proceed. Number three, God will never diminish your life, He will only multiply your life. You never one time find a place in the New Testament where Jesus met somebody and when they, Jesus left them, they had less than when he met them. God will never diminish your life. God will only multiply into your life. John 2 verse 6, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So I looked this up on the internet. We're talking about 570 liters of water that was turned into fine wine. I, I, I don't know anything about wine, so I went online, and, you know, wine starts at like 50 bucks. Well, you know, that's whatever, wino stuff. And then, you know, if you click on the finer wines, it runs, you know, $500 minimum to four, like $4,000 a bottle. So I just did the math, and I averaged 25 gallons times six jars and broke that out into liters and then figured 750 milliliters of wine bottles and then I figured a moderate price of $500 a bottle because the, the master of the banquet said you have, you have held on to the best until last. And so when you go online, and again, I don't know anything about wine, but you go online, you, you click fine wine, the prices start at $500, and then they go up to $4,000. But at $500 a bottle, we're talking about $375,000. Now, if you don't think that's a miracle, and if you don't think that is a money miracle, then in the offering coming up, make sure and give no less than $375,000 so we'll all know you're not a religious hypocrite. Well, I just don't think that's about money. I just don't, I just don't think that's a financial miracle. I just don't believe that. All right, punk. 
then give in excess of $375,000 and we'll know that that's your opinion. It was a financial miracle. Say it out loud. The first miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ was a financial miracle. The first miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ was a miracle of increase. This is Christianity. I said, this is Christianity. You know, I, I hope America is enjoying their non-Christian economy. I mean, you know, I want to stand up and shout it from the housetops. You wanted it, you got it. But Christianity is not a faith that divides. Christianity is not a faith that subtracts. Christianity is not a faith that diminishes. Christianity is not a faith that is going to take something from your life. Mm -hmm. yeah, Christianity adds. Christianity multiplies. Mm -hmm. Christianity takes what is and always makes it better, not less, better, more, not less, more. Mm -hmm. This is what Christianity does. Mm -hmm. If you're here this morning and, you know, your, your marriage is a mess or your family life's a mess or your finances are a mess or your work life is a mess, a mess. Christianity, Christianity takes what you have. Christianity takes where you are. Christianity takes your experience right now and betters it. Yes. It betters it. It improves it. You know, every time we go and we preach in Kenya, every time we go and we preach in Mombasa, Pastor Sue always comments. She says, what kind of crazy religion makes women wear a uh, crown of the head to soles of the feet, black garments, covers up everything, when it's uh, 100 degrees and 100% humidity? Why would you do that to women? See, in other words, if you join Buddhism... Well, Buddhism is about suffering. These other faiths are going to diminish. These other faiths, and you know, they, they love to diminish women. Christianity lifts up. Christianity builds up. Christianity increases. Christianity elevates. It takes what you've got and makes it better. That's what Christianity does. Whether it's your marriage or your family or your finances or uh, your ability to produce on the job, Jesus, see, if Jesus had been a politician when there were those thousands of people and they were hungry, he, would have, he wouldn't have asked the boy for his lunch. He would have confiscated it. Mm -hmm. And then he, he, would have, he would have gotten, you know, some Benny Hanna, Benny Hanna knives. What's the name of that restaurant? Benny Hanna knives and chopped it up, you know, into 10,000 pieces and passed it around and everybody would have gone home hungry. Right? That's right. Isn't that what a politician would do? Yeah, yeah but not Jesus. The boy gave his lunch to Jesus and Jesus prayed over it and he what? He blessed it. And because he prayed over it and he blessed it, it multiplied out. And when everybody had their fill and they gathered up what was left over, there was more than what the boy had given Jesus in the first place. That's what Christianity does. Amen. I said, that's what Christianity does. Amen. So listen, I don't care if it's 2013. We're Christian people. We're not ashamed of it. Amen. This is the way to go. Because Christianity is about improvement and blessing. Number four, it takes faith and guts to get anywhere with God. It takes faith, but let me tell you what, it's going to take some guts. It's going to take some courage. Verse seven, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jar with, jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. Well, the Bible doesn't really deal with the feelings and the thoughts of the servants, but don't you think it took some guts to take that water to the master of the banquet. But remember what Mary said. Remember what Mary said. Whatever he tells you to do, do. 
He told them to fill the jars with water. The minds of the host had been on lack. Jesus' mind was on plenty. The minds of the host had been horrified at the coming embarrassment. And I love this about the Lord. The Lord was tuned in to the embarrassment that was coming. Now, we can't relate to this. We're Christian people. We don't serve wine at wedding receptions, but that was the culture. That was the day. That's what they did. And somebody, I've had people ask me a hundred times since I pioneered this church, you know, why did they drink wine in the New Testament? Why was that not a problem? Why do we not drink wine today? Why do we not drink beer today? And then, of course, the answer is what Paul said, to avoid even the appearance of evil. But then also, I have to point out, on a very practical level, that the worst case scenario back then was you rode your donkey drunk. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, this is one practical preacher. I mean, how much damage could be done riding your donkey home drunk? Right? So, but in our day, in our day, probably there's not a person here who doesn't know a family that's been touched by a tragedy dealing with drunk driving or people under the influence of other substances. Amen. And there's not anybody here this morning that in the last seven days, you did not say what comes out of my mouth every seven days and Pastor Sue's mouth every seven days. You see somebody do something on the road and you say, they've got to be stoned. <laughs> Right? right? But in that day, in that time, in that culture, they were headed to a great big embarrassment. I mean, this is a wedding, man. This is a big deal, man. This is a once-in-a-lifetime event, hopefully. And, and then you have the party, and you invite the guests, and you, and you run out of wine. And I love the fact that Jesus was tuned into that. That tells me he's tuned into my situation. Say it out loud. Jesus, Jesus. is tuned into my situation. See, you're trying to buy those kids shoes to go back to school. And, and, and you're trying to, you know, cut the water off so your water bill's not so high. And, and you're trying to watch the lights and turn the lights off and maybe run the air a little one degree warmer, watching the electric bill. You're, you're doing what you know to do. And it's so easy to feel like that I'm in this thing alone. But friend, you are not in this thing alone. You are not facing your circumstances alone. You are in this thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you, if you neglect that relationship, if you don't call on the name of the Lord, if you do not take action to release his power in your life, then you do without. Jesus' mind was on the miracle that was on the way. His mind was on demonstrating the glory of God. Their minds had been on the limitations that they faced. Jesus' mind was on the limitless resources of God the Father. Jesus knew there was plenty. All that was needed was a little anointing on the situation. All these servants had to do was to obey the instructions of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Pastor Sue is constantly telling me, when you give a thing to God, it never remains small. Say it out loud. When you give a thing to God, it never remains small. If you've got something like a bank account and it seems small, you're tired of it being small, well, you gotta give it, you gotta do what that boy did. You gotta give your lunch to the Lord, you gotta give it to the Lord. If it's too small, give it to God. If it's not enough, give it to God. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So if it's too small, give it to God. If it's not enough, give it to God. And when you give a thing to God, it never remains small. There's no shortage of God's resources to supply all of your needs. 
By their obedience, these servants opened themselves up to God. They had obeyed Jesus. Now they were going to have the privilege of seeing his first miracle. I mean, my God. I mean, in 6,000 years of mankind upon the planet, there was only a handful that witnessed the first miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these guys were those. So there are no shortages in the earth. There's no shortage of money. There's, no shor there's only a shortage of faith. It's unbelievable. I mean, they have got, they've, they've got people convinced that there's a shortage of electricity. Well, you know, my God, it's it was 110 yesterday, and I noticed everything was still running. How can there be a shortage of electricity? Well, there's a shortage of water. Is that right? Something that falls free from the heavens. The guy that washes my cars can't go to certain cities now because certain cities will come by and ticket him for wasting water. I told him, I said, that's moronic. I mean, literally, moronic. There's no adjective I could use to adequately describe how stupid that is. Because anybody who's been to high school chemistry knows once an element is an element, it can never change. So H, hydrogen, is always hydrogen. And O, oxygen, is always oxygen. You cannot change them. H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, is always water. It cannot be changed. Oh, but it spilled on the ground. Well, wait a minute. I thought we wanted the aquifers to fill back up. <laughs> because you wash your car, that goes into the grass, the grass gets some of it. What the grass doesn't need, it goes on down into the soil. That goes on down hundreds and hundreds of feet, and it ends up in something called an aquifer. It doesn't disappear. <laughs> I mean, do they, are they so stupid they think that when you wash your car, that water goes to Mars? <laughs> oh, we can't flush our toilets. Well, what do you think happens to that water? Does it leave planet Earth? It's somewhere. In the United States of America, there's not a lack of money. There's a lack of intelligence. And in the United States of America, there's not a lack of money. There is a lack of faith. When you come here, you get both. Amen. Amen. So say it out loud. In God, in God there, are no there are no shortages. In God, in God there, is no lack. there is no lack. See, that's something we ought to remind, renew our minds to every day before we go to work. Man, we ought to do that to, um, Tuesday morning when we go to work. Say it out loud in the car. In God, in God there are no shortages. Are no shortages. In, God, in God, there is no lack. See, if they had not obeyed, they would have missed seeing Jesus' first miracle. Let me ask you a question. Aren't you tired of missing God's best? I, <laughs> I think I'm more tired of it than anybody here. I know that I know that I know that I could have believed for more, that I could have had more, that I could have experienced more. I don't want to miss one more thing that God has for me in the time I have left. I don't want to miss one more thing God has for me in the time I have left. So notice also that when they obeyed Jesus, when they did something, turn, tell your neighbor, your miracle may very well require action on your part. Tell the neighbor on the other side, your miracle may very well require action on your part. 
Number five, if you'll have the faith and guts to do what Jesus tells you to do, your ending will be greater than your beginning because he'll never lead you into the ditch. He'll never diminish you. Verse nine, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. So stop doubting the power of your own faith in God. Jesus said, whosoever shall say. How many of you qualify as a whosoever? And he didn't say you've got to have Mount Everest-sized faith. He said, whoever has faith is a mustard seed. In other words, just a little bit of faith released has greater power than all the doubt in the world. So stop doubting the power of your own faith. Release your faith in God and he will show you plenty. And how do you release your faith in God? By doing what God says to do in his word and by doing what God says to do by his spirit. Number six, wrapping it up. If you'll be honest, when you read the Bible, you will see that Jesus reveals his glory in your needs being met and your desires coming to pass. Jesus does not reveal his glory in your poverty. Jesus does not reveal his glory in your lack. I hate poverty. Ask Pastor Sue. I hate it. I hate it. I hate poverty. I hate what poverty does to people. I hate it. You go to the grocery store, it's so sad. You go to the grocery store and, uh, and you fill up your cart and, and you have organic vegetables and you have organic chicken and, and, and you have organic milk and you will do all that. I mean, I'm telling you, it's 200 bucks right now. Am I right, ladies? And you see poor people at the grocery store. And what do they have? Ding-dongs and potato chips. And why are they buying all that? Well, it's cheap. And then they just get huge. You don't get huge eating quality. You get huge eating cheap stuff. And then it clogs up your arteries, chock full of all that preservative stuff, all that negative stuff. I hate it. I hate, I hate what poverty does to people's teeth. I hate it. I don't believe a person can be, I don't believe a, a minister could really be a Christian and be okay with poverty. I don't believe it. There'll be no poverty in heaven. There's going to be no section eight in heaven. Amen. You know, I was at the grocery store the other day and they got that pen thing you point, point and I, I, pointed to EBT and I thought, oh Jesus, let me out of there. And I had to, I had to, I had to back up out of there. I, I thought, oh, I don't want that anywhere near me. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. I want you to hear me now. God loves you. God is concerned about the minutest detail of your life all the way down to buying running shoes for your kids to have to go back to school, all the way down to, you know, you're being able to go to the doctor and pay what has to be paid to get done what you got to get done, taking care of yourself. God loves you. He is tuned in to the minutest detail of your life. And he's not against you. He's not trying to sabotage you. He's not trying to diminish you. He's not trying to take you backwards in any area. He loves you. He wants to bless your life. He wants to multiply what you have. He wants to take the good that you have and accentuate it. He said, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Verse 11, this the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Say it out loud. Jesus revealed his glory by meeting their need. The glory of God was not, is not, and never can be revealed in lack. And all these folks, you know, religious folks, including a lot of Christian folks, they have a problem with prosperity. 
which I completely don't understand. Because didn't he, t- didn't he teach them? Pray this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy what? Will be done where? On earth, even as it is where? In heaven. In heaven, what? How many EBT cards are there in heaven? How much section eight? How many ghettos? How much welfare? How many double wides? May thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. And I frankly believe this is part of why Christianity has become the minority perspective in this country. Because preachers, they were preaching sickness, they were preaching poverty, and frankly, who needs it? Because I can get sick on my own and I can get poor on my own. I don't need any help. He thus, I love it, he thus revealed his glory. Won't you dare to believe God? Won't you come and go with Sue and I? Won't you come and go with Sue and I as we let God reveal his glory in our lives? Won't you come and go with us as we allow Jesus Christ to reveal himself in our lives, healing our bodies, strengthening our homes, strengthening our families, opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out more blessing upon us than we're even able to contain. Won't you come and go? That's what we're preaching here. And the beautiful thing about, the beautiful thing about the Lord is He's a whosoever God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever, whosoever shall speak to the mountain. So there's no discrimination in God. How did Jesus reveal his glory? Was his glory revealed by their lack and by their failure? No, a thousand times no. His glory was revealed by the miracle of plenty, the miracle of provision. And finally, number seven, more people will believe in your God if your needs are met than if you keep struggling along in poverty and lack. Verse 11, this, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. They were transformed. Their faith was now focused. They saw not the problem. They saw not the shortage, but instead they saw the provision of God. How your life will change when you begin to see the provision of God instead of the shortage. So, as we conclude, I want to say, get your eyes off the need and get your eyes on the supply. Jesus is his name, and the word is his how-to manual. If you want to harvest like you've never seen before, then you're going to have to sow a seed like you've never sown before. When God asks you to give out of your life, it's only because he is preparing to give into your life. God will tell you to release something. He'll tell you to give something because he's trying to get something better to you. Never one time, never one time have, has he spoken to me to give something and he did not come behind that and give me something better in its place. God would not dare to ask you to give without setting you up to receive. You're never going to go backwards giving to God. God then is your... Your giving then is God's ticket to earth. God wants to move in your life. God wants to increase your life. God wants to multiply your life. But how's he going to do that if you don't open the door by taking some action of faith? God will never diminish your life. He will only add to your life or multiply into your life. And I said regarding what Pastor Sue said that uh, if something is small, you have to give it to God. If you give a thing to God, it cannot remain small. So if what you have doesn't meet your need, it must be your seed. Yield what you have to God and he'll multiply it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 that he supplies seed to the sower. So give God something to work with and then believe God for a great harvest. 
See, I believe this. I believe that our giving is a small thing next to what God wants to do in our lives. Oh, that this country would turn to God. Oh, that this country would turn to the word of God. Oh, that people would see once again the goodness of God and that he reveals his glory, not in our lack. He reveals his glory in our abundance. He loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Can you say amen? Amen. I'm out of time. I hope you enjoyed the message this morning.